Hey guys, welcome back um, to our, what is it, third week of learning. What we are going to be looking at today is the end of World War I. So grab a sheet of paper if you want to take some notes. If you have any questions as we get through this, please, please don't hesitate to contact me and reach out. Remember World War I, it was the first major global full-scale war that we've seen and it's going to have lasting repercussions internationally. So let me pull up PowerPoint for us so y'all can follow along. All right, so today and we'll wrap this up on Tuesday, Wednesday this week, we're looking at the decisions of the Versailles Treaty. This is the peace treaty that ends World War I. Specifically, we'll be looking at the creation of the League of Nations, the German reparations, and the mandate system that develops out of the old Ottoman Empire territory. Approximately 22 million soldiers and civilians died during World War I. This was the deadliest war the world had ever seen. Um, approximately half the total troops that fought in the war ended up either wounded or killed. This is a photograph taken in France from the end of the war where you can see some of the soldiers lying um, who had perished during battle. In the background of this one, you can see the beginnings of the memorial cemeteries that would be created. There are cemeteries in Europe from World War I and of course then 20 years later, World War II. Generally, soldiers would be buried near to the place where they died. It was less expensive than having to ship the bodies home for burial, and in some cases, it just wasn't possible to take the bodies home. Also, this is the first time we start to see acknowledgement of the disfiguring injuries. Uh, remember, this was the first war where we see the use of chemical warfare, the mustard and chlorine gas that could blind, burn skin. Um, we see a lot of loss of limbs from the use of the bombs, the mortars, the tank shells. Entire European towns were destroyed. Some towns in France, in fact, were completely wiped off the map and have never been rebuilt. This is a pre-war image of the village of Esnes. This is after the war. After the bombings, after the battles had moved through, these, the new weapons, the new types of guns, the tanks, the mortar shells, all of this contributed to the destruction of these towns and villages. Verdun was one of the um, bloodiest battles of the war. This is one of the hotels prior to the war. After the war, complete rubble. This is a town in Belgium where another major battle had been fought. You can see that very little is left standing. Woodrow Wilson, the president of the US at the time, wanted to take a lead in shaping what was gonna come next, the peace process. He developed a plan that he called the 14 points. There were 14 ideas that he had that he wanted to put into place as part of the peace process. He wanted to get rid of those main reasons for the war. The rampant militarism, imperialism, nationalism, all the conflicting alliances that led to that chain reaction that had started World War I. Ideally, he wanted to avoid any future wars by creating an international organization, what would become known as the League of Nations to discuss, talk through, and arbitrate problems, work through any major conflicts 
before it got to the point of having to declare war. So as you go through and look at these next sections, think about and jot down what each section means in your own words. You will need this information later today to complete your assignment. So the first five points. This focus on creating international rules to eliminate future wars. So freedom of the seas, free trade agreements, reducing the size and equipment of the militaries. So no more secret treaties, no more secret alliances. Everything would be public. Ideally, you wouldn't have conflicting alliances at all. Reduction in the size of the militaries, free seas, free trade. So none of this unrestricted submarine warfare that the Germans had been employing during the war. And international control over colonies to start ending imperialism. The colonies would not necessarily get their independence overnight. Um, he proposed what would become a mandate system that we'll talk about tomorrow. But he did want to start reducing the imperial process. The next points focus on dividing up the empires. So breaking up the large empires of Europe and the Middle East, specifically Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. And, and creating new nations based on the concept of self-determination. Self-determination basically means that, oops, sorry, the new nations should be created and consider the ethnic and national identities of the people. In other words, the people that would make up these new nations should be free to choose their own government. They should be free to create the system that works best for them. So some of the areas will be um, Alsace-Lorraine, um, especially in Austria-Hungary, completely breaking up the empire. We'll see lots of new countries form out of this. And the Ottoman Empire will break up into some independent countries and some mandates. And the very last point, and this is the one that is most clearly and directly implemented as part of the peace process is creating the League of Nations, this international organization to try and work through the problems and conflicts between countries before it became a situation where you had to declare war. So there are four people who will be especially instrumental at the Paris peace process. The British Prime Minister, um, the Italian Prime Minister, although he will have a much smaller role, the French Premier, and the U.S. President. The peace conference will be held in Versailles, the palace that had been built by Louis XIV during the absolute monarch era of France, To and this is where that peace treaty will be created and signed. Wilson hopes that his 14 points will become the framework for the treaty. He will be somewhat disappointed. Most European leaders, specifically Britain, Italian, France, Belgium, places where the war had been fought, where it was especially costly, wanted to punish Germany. They didn't want just peace. They wanted Germany to suffer. So the French are going to be especially pushing for a harsh punishment for Germany. Um, they wanted to crush the Germans to completely eliminate any possibility that they would ever again invade France. Um, French Premier Clemenceau thought Wilson was being nice to Germany, too kind to Germany with his plans for a peace without victory that we just need to all work out our differences, let bygones be bygones and call it a day. The British Prime Minister was kind of that halfway point between Wilson in the U.S. and Clemenceau of France. He realized that if you destroy Germany and crush them, crush their spirit, it would eventually be bad for Europe. He was very concerned about long-term effects, and he had a reason to be, as we'll see later. 
So during this peace process, Wilson did have to compromise some of his 14 points. He's not going to get everything he wanted. The treaty is agreed on in late June of 1919. Excuse me, sorry. This is Versailles today. Remember, this is the palace where the treaty was signed um, today. If it was open right now, you could go visit it. Hopefully someday, maybe some of y'all will get to see it in the future. This is the Hall of Mirrors, where the people, um, a lot of those representatives of the Treaty of Versailles met. This is an image um, from very recently. This is an image of the delegates at Versailles in 1919. So even though there were certain major leaders of the delegate parties, there were still lots and lots of people who showed up to listen, observe, discuss. It was a very crowded room. Sorry, sitting outside and bugs are flying at me. One thing they did agree on was to create a League of Nations. So this is going to be a general assembly that has 27 member nations. Um, not a whole lot. Today, there's over 200 nations in the world. The members agreed to use diplomacy, talking it out, making agreements to settle conflicts instead of going to war, and try to actively work together to avoid war. Wilson couldn't sign the treaty. So the U.S. has restrictions on how treaty, international treaties get signed, and the U.S. Senate, part of the legislative body, has to approve, ratify, approve the treaty in order to sign a treaty or make an international agreement. The senators didn't want to sign. They didn't want to join the League of Nations and be connected to other international groups. A lot of people in the U.S. wanted to go back into an isolationist focus on ourselves mentality. So this is a political cartoon that got published in a newspaper. Um, if you look at the top, um, you can see the sign, this League of Nations bridge was designed by the president of the USA, acknowledging this is part of Wilson's 14 points. If you look at the bridge itself, you can see a block labeled Belgium, France, England, Italy, all countries that signed on to the League of Nations, but there's a gap the U.S. It's called the Keystone. You can see the Uncle Sam figure leaning against it. The treaty will be weaker and the League of Nations will be less effective because the U.S. didn't join. It was an American plan. People saw the U.S. as an instrumental force in having helped end the war because of when their military joined in and there will be less effectiveness within the League of Nations partly because the U.S. did not join. And we'll see some of the ineffectiveness when we start looking at the buildup to World War II. So if you look at the map, the members of the League of Nations are in black. So all of Europe pretty much joined, except what was Russia, um, most of course of Africa because they were colonies of those British nations, China, Australia, much of South America except for Brazil, Canada joined, but it's notable that the U.S. did not. The U.S. was one of the stronger world powers after World War I, but never joined, and the U.S. will sign its own separate peace treaty with Germany a couple years later in 1921. So next time, we'll be looking at what happened to Germany and what happened to the Ottoman Empire. Again, remember, if you have questions about any of this, please don't hesitate to reach out. Contact me, contact your teacher. Please reach out. Let us know how we can help you and learn about this process and anything else that you might need.